good mother. In the pre-dawn light, the dinosaurs came out of the bushes and went directly toward the jeep. There were six of them, big brown duckbills, 15 feet high, with curving snouts. Myosaurs, Levine said. I didn't know there were any here. What are they doing? The huge animals clustered around the jeep and immediately began to tear it apart. One ripped away the canvas top. Another poked at the roll bar, rocking the vehicle back and forth. I don't understand, Levine said. They're hadrosaurs, herbivores. This aggressiveness is quite uncharacteristic. Uh-huh, Thorne said. As they watched, the myosaurs tipped the jeep over. The vehicle crashed over on its side. One of the adults reared up and stood on the side panels. Its huge feet crushed the vehicle inward. But when the jeep fell over, two white styrofoam cases tumbled out onto the ground. The myosaurs seemed to be focused on these cases. They nipped at the styrofoam, tossing chunks of white around the ground. They moved hurriedly in a kind of frenzy. Something to eat? Levine said. Some kind of dinosaur catnip? What? Then the top of one case tore away, and they saw a cracked egg inside. Protruding from the egg was a wrinkled bit of flesh. The myosaurs slowed. Their movements were now cautious, gentle. They honked and grunted. The big bodies of the animals blocked their view. There was a squeaking sound. You're kidding, Levine said. On the ground, a tiny animal moved about. Its body was pale brown, almost white. It tried to stand, but flopped down at once. It was barely a foot long, with wrinkled folds of flesh around its neck. In a moment, a second animal tumbled out beside it. Harding sighed. Slowly, one of the myosaurs ducked its huge head down and gently scooped the baby up in its broad bill. It kept its mouth open as it raised its head. The baby sat calmly on the adult's tongue, looking around with its tiny head as it rose high into the air. The second baby was picked up. The adults milled around for a moment as if unsure whether there was more to do, and then, honking loudly, they all moved off, leaving behind a crumpled, shattered vehicle. Thorn said, I guess gas is no longer a problem. I guess not, Sarah said. Thorne stared at the wreckage of the jeep, shaking his head. It's worse than a head-on collision, he said. It looks like it's been put in a compactor. It just wasn't built for those sorts of stresses. Levine snorted. Engineers in Detroit didn't expect a five-ton animal to stand on it. You know, Thorne said, I would have liked to see how our own car stood up under that. You mean because we beefed it up? Yes, Thorne said. We really built it to take fantastic stresses, huge stresses. Ran it through computer programs, added those honeycomb panels, the whole... Wait a minute, Harding said, turning away from the window. What are you talking about? The other car, Thorne said. What other car? The car we brought, he said, the Explorer. Of course, she said, suddenly excited. There's another car I completely forgot. The Explorer. Well, it's history now, Thorne said. It shorted out last night when I was coming back to the trailer. I ran it through a puddle and it shorted out. So, maybe it's still... No, Thorne said, shaking his head. A short like that to blow the VR. It's an electric car. It's dead. I'm surprised you don't have circuit breakers for that. Well, we never used to put them in, although on this latest version... He trailed off. He shook his head. I can't believe it. The car has circuit breakers? Yes. Eddie put them in last minute. So the car might still run? Yes, it probably would if you reset the breakers. Where is it? She said. She was heading for the motorcycle. I left it on that side road that runs from the ridge road down to the hide. But Sarah... It's our only chance, she said. She pulled down her radio headset, adjusted the microphone to her cheek, and rolled the motorcycle to the door. Call me, she said. I'm going to go find us a car. They watched through the windows. In the early morning light, she climbed onto the motorcycle and roared off up the hill. Levine watched her go. What do you figure her odds are? Thorn just shook his head. 
The radio crackled. Doc? Thorne picked it up. Yes, Sarah. I'm coming up the hill now. I see there's six of them. Raptors? Yeah, they're, uh... Listen, I'm going to try another path. I see a... The radio crackled. Sarah? She was breaking up. Sort of a game trail that... Here, think I better... Sarah, Thorne said, you're breaking up. Do now, so just schmeelock. Over the radio, they heard the hum of the bike. Then they heard another sound, which might have been an animal snarl and might have been more static. Thorne bent forward, holding the radio close to his ear. Then, abruptly, the radio clicked and was silent. He said, Sarah. There was no answer. Maybe she turned it off, Levine said. Thorne shook his head. Sarah! Nothing. Sarah, are you there? They waited. Nothing. Hell, Thorne said. Time passed slowly. Levine stood by the window, staring out. Kelly was snoring in a corner. Arby lay next to Malcolm, fast asleep. And Malcolm was humming tunelessly. Thorne sat on the floor in the center of the room, leaning back against the checkout counter. Every so often he'd pick up the radio and try to call Sarah, but there was never any answer. He tried all six channels. There was no answer on any of them. Eventually, he stopped trying. The radio crackled. Hey, these damned things never work right. A grunt. Can't figure out what things damn. Across the room, Levine sat forward. Thorne grabbed the radio. Sarah, Sarah? Finally, she said, her voice crackling. Where the hell have you been, Doc? Are you all right? Of course I'm all right. There's something wrong with your radio. You're breaking up. Yeah, what should I do? Try screwing down the cover on your battery pack. It's probably loose. No, I mean, what should I do about the car? Thorne said. What? I'm at the car, Doc. I'm there. What should I do? Levine glanced at his watch. Twenty minutes until the helicopter arrives, he said. You know, she just might make it. Dodgson. Dodgson awoke, aching and stiff on the floor of the concrete utility shed. He got to his feet and looked out the window. He saw streaks of red in a pale blue sky. He opened the door to the utility shed and went outside. He was very thirsty, and his body was sore. He started walking beneath the canopy of trees. The jungle around him was silent in the early morning. He needed water. More than anything, he needed water. Somewhere off to his left, he heard the soft gurgle of a stream. He headed toward it, moving more quickly. Through the trees, he could see the sky growing lighter. He knew that Malcolm and his party were still here. They must have some plan to get off the island. If they could get off, he could too. He came over a low rise and looked down at a gully and a flowing stream. It looked clear. He hurried down toward it, wondering if it was polluted. He decided he didn't care. Just before he reached the stream, he tripped over a vine and fell, swearing. He got to his feet and looked back. Then he saw it wasn't a vine he had tripped over. It was the strap of a green backpack. Dodgson tugged at the strap and the whole backpack slid out of the foliage. The pack had been torn apart and it was crusty with dried blood. As he pulled it, the contents clattered out among the ferns. Flies were buzzing everywhere, but he saw a camera, a metal case for food, and a plastic water bottle. He searched quickly through the surrounding ferns, but he didn't find much else, except some soggy candy bars. Dodgson drank the water and then realized he was very hungry. He popped open the metal case, hoping for some decent food, but the case didn't contain food. It was filled with foam packing, and in the center of the packing was a radio. He flicked it on. The battery light glowed strongly. He flicked from one channel to another, hearing static. Then a man's voice. Sarah, this is Thorne. Sarah? After a moment, a woman's voice. Doc, did you hear me? I said I'm at the car. Dodgson listened and smiled.
So there was a car. In the store, Thorne held the radio close to his cheek. Okay, he said. Sarah, listen carefully. Get in the car and do exactly what I tell you. Okay, fine, she said. But tell me first, is Levine there? He's here. The radio clicked. She said, ask him if there's any danger from a green dinosaur that's about four feet tall and has a domed forehead. Levine nodded. Tell her yes. They're called pachycephalosaurs. He says yes. Thorne said, they're pachycephalos somethings and you should be careful. Why? Because there's about 50 of them all around the car. Explorer. The explorer was sitting in the middle of a shady section of the road with overhanging trees above. The car had stopped just beyond a depression where there had no doubt been a large puddle the night before. Now the puddle had become a mud hole, thanks to the dozen or so animals that sat in it, splashed in it, drank from it, and rolled at its edges. These were the green dome-headed dinosaurs that she had been watching for the last few minutes, trying to decide what to do. Because not only were they near the mud hole, they were also located in front of the car and around the sides of the car. She had watched the pachycephalosaurs with uneasiness. Harding had spent a lot of time on the ground with wild animals, but usually animals she knew well. From long experience, she knew how closely she could approach and under what circumstances. If this were a herd of wildebeest, she would walk right in without hesitation. If it were a herd of American buffalo, she would be cautious, but she'd still go in. And if it were a herd of African buffalo, she wouldn't go anywhere near them. She pushed the microphone against her cheek and said, How much time left? Twenty minutes. Then I better get in there, she said. Any ideas? There was a pause. The radio crackled. Levine says nobody knows anything about these animals, Sarah. Great. Levine says a complete skeleton has never been recovered, so nobody has even a guess about their behavior except that they're probably aggressive. Great, she said. She was looking at the situation of the car and the overhanging trees. It was a shady area, peaceful and quiet in the early morning light. The radio crackled. Levine says you might try walking slowly in and see if the herd lets you through, but no quick movements, no sudden gestures. She stared at the animals and thought, they have those domed heads for a reason. No thanks, she said. I'm going to try something else. What? In the store, Levine said, What did she say? She said she was going to try something else. Like what? Levine said. He went to the window and looked out. The sky was growing lighter. He frowned. There was some consequence to that, he thought. Something he knew in the back of his mind but wasn't thinking about. Something about daylight and territory. Territory. Levine looked out at the sky again, trying to put it together. What difference did it make that daylight was coming? He shook his head, gave it up for the moment. How long to reset the breakers? Just a minute or two, Thorne said. Then there might still be time, Levine said. There was static hiss from the radio, and they heard Harding say, Okay, I'm above the car. You're where? I'm above the car, she said, in a tree. Harding climbed out on the branch, moving farther from the trunk, feeling it bend under her weight. The branch seemed supple. She was now ten feet above the car, swinging lower. Few of the animals below had looked up at her, but the herd seemed to be restless. Animals sitting in the mud got up and began to turn and mill. She saw their tails flicking back and forth anxiously. She moved farther out, and the branch bent lower. It was slippery from the night's rain. She tried to gauge her position above the car. It looked pretty good, she thought. Suddenly, one of the animals charged the trunk of the tree she was in, butting it hard. The impact was surprisingly forceful. The tree swayed, her branch swinging up and down while she struggled to hold on. Oh, shit, she thought. She rose up into the air, came down again, and then she lost her grip. Her hands slipped on wet leaves and wet bark, and she fell free. At the last moment, she saw that she would miss the car entirely. Then she hit the ground, landing hard in muddy earth, right beside 
the animals. The radio crackled. Sarah, Thorne said. There was no answer. What's she doing now? Levine began to pace nervously. I wish we could see what she's doing. In the corner of the room, Kelly got up, rubbing her eyes. Why don't you use the video? Thorne said. What video? Kelly pointed to the cash registers. That's a computer. It is? Yeah, I think so. Kelly yawned as she sat in the chair facing the cash register. It looked like a dumb terminal, which meant it probably didn't have access to much, but it was worth a try anyway. She turned it on. Nothing happened. She flicked the power switch back and forth. Nothing. Idly, she swung her legs and kicked a wire beneath the table. She bent over and saw that the terminal was unplugged. So she plugged it in. The screen glowed, and a single word appeared. Log in. To proceed further, she knew she needed a password. Arby had a password. She glanced over and saw that he was still asleep. She didn't want to wake him up. She remembered that he had written it down on a piece of paper and stuck it in his pocket. Maybe it was still in his clothes, she thought. She crossed the room, found the bundle of his wet, muddy clothes, and began going through the pockets. She found his wallet, the keys to his house, and some other stuff. Finally, she found a piece of paper in his back pocket. It was damp and streaked with mud. The ink had smeared, but she could still read his writing. Kelly took the paper and went back to the computer. She typed in all the characters carefully and pressed the return key. The screen went blank, and then a new screen came up. She was surprised. It was different from the screen she had seen earlier in the trailer. InGen, Site B Network Services. She was in the system. But the whole thing looked different, maybe because this wasn't the radio net, she thought. She must be logged into the actual laboratory system. It had more graphics because the terminal was hardwired. Maybe they even ran optical pipe out here. Across the room, Levine said, Kelly, how about it? I'm working on it, she said. Cautiously, she began to type. Rows of icons appeared rapidly across the screen, one after another. She knew she was looking at a graphic interface of some kind, but the meaning of the images wasn't obvious to her, and there were no explanations. The people who had used the system were probably trained to know what the images meant, but Kelly didn't know. She wanted to get into the video system, yet none of the pictures suggested anything to do with video. She moved the cursor around, wondering what to do. She decided she'd have to guess. She picked the diamond-shaped icon on the lower left and clicked on it. InGen Biowaste Production Control. Uh-oh, she said, alarmed. Levine looked over. Something wrong? No, she said. It's fine. She quickly clicked on the header and got back to the previous screen. This time, she tried one of the triangular-shaped icons. The screen changed again. InGen Video Security Network. That's it, she thought. Immediately the image popped off and the actual video images began to flash up on the screen. On this little cash register monitor, the pictures were tiny, but now she was in familiar territory. And she moved around quickly, moving the cursor, manipulating the images. What are you looking for, she said. The Explorer, Thorne said. She clicked the screen. The image zoomed up. Got it she said. Levine said, you do? He sounded surprised. Kelly looked at him and said, yeah, I do. The two men came and stared at the screen over her shoulder. They could see the explorer on a shaded road. They could see the pachycephalosaurs, lots of them milling around the car. The animals were poking at the tires in the front fender, but they didn't see Sarah anywhere. Where is she? Thorne said. Sarah Harding was underneath the car, lying on her face in the mud. She had crawled there after she fell. It was the only place to go. And now she was staring out at the animal's feet milling all around her. She said, Doc, are you there? Doc? Doc? But the damned radio wasn't working again. The packies were stamping and snorting, trying to get at her under the car. Then she remembered that Thorne had said something about screwing down the battery pack. She reached behind her back and found the pack and twisted the cover shut tight. 
Immediately her earpiece began to crackle with static. Doc, she said. Where are you? Thorne said. I'm under the car. Why? Did you already try it? Try what? Try to start it, to start the car. No, she said. I didn't try to start it. I fell. Well, as long as you're under there, you can check the breakers, Thorne said. The breakers are under the car? Some of them. Look up by the front wheels. She twisted her body, sliding in the mud. Okay, I'm looking. There's a box right behind the front bumper, over on the left. I see it. Can you open it? I think so. She crawled forward and pulled at the latch. The lid came down. She was staring at three black switches. I see three switches, and they're all pointing up. Up? Toward the front of the car. Hmm, Thorne said. That doesn't make sense. Can you read the writing? Yes, it says 15VV and then 02R. Okay, he said. That explains it. What? The box is in backward. Flip all the switches the other way. Are you dry? No, Doc, I'm soaking wet lying in the damn mud. Well, then use your shirt sleeve or something. Harding pulled herself forward, approaching the bumper. The nearest packies snorted and banged on the bumper. They leaned down and twisted their heads, trying to get to her. They have very bad breath, she said. Say again. Never mind. She flipped the switches one after another. She heard a hum from the car above her. Okay, I did it. The car's making a noise. That's fine, Thorne said. What do I do now? Nothing. You better wait. She lay back in the mud, looking at the feet of the packies. They were moving, tramping all around her. How much time left, she said. About ten minutes, she said. Well, I'm stuck under here, Doc. I know. She looked at the animals. They were on all sides of the car. If anything, they seemed to be growing more active and excited. They stamped their feet and snuffled impatiently. Why were they so worked up, she wondered. And then, suddenly, they all thundered off. They ran toward the front of the car and away up the road. She twisted her body and watched them go. There was silence. Doc, she said. Yeah. Why did they leave? Stay under the car, Thorne said. Doc, don't talk. The radio clicked off. She waited, not sure what was happening. She had heard the tension in Thorne's voice. She didn't know why. But now she heard a soft, scuffling sound, and looking over saw two feet standing by the driver's side of the car, two feet in muddy boots, men's boots. Harding frowned. She recognized the boots. She recognized the khaki trousers, even though they were now caked with mud. It was Dodgson. The man's boots turned to face the door. She heard the door latch click. Dodgson was getting in the car. Harding acted so swiftly. She was not aware of thinking. Grunting, she swung her body around sideways, reached out with her arms, grabbed both ankles, and pulled hard. Dodson fell, giving a yell of surprise. He landed on his back and turned, his face dark and angry. He saw her and scowled. No shit, he said. I thought I finished you off on the boat. Harding went red with rage and started to crawl out from under the car. Dodgson scrambled to his knees as she was halfway out, but then she felt the ground begin to shake, and she immediately knew why. She saw Dodgson look over his shoulder and flatten himself on the ground. Hurriedly, he started to crawl under the car beside her. She turned in the mud, looking down along the length of the car, and she saw a Tyrannosaurus coming up the road toward them. The ground vibrated with each step. Now Dodgson was crawling toward the center of the car, pushing himself close to her, but she ignored him. She watched the big feet with the splayed claws as they came alongside the car and stopped. Each foot was three feet long. She heard the Tyrannosaur growling. She looked at Dodgson. His eyes were wide with terror. 
The tyrannosaur paused beside the car. The big feet shifted. She heard the animal somewhere above sniffing. Then, growling again, the head came down. The lower jaw touched the ground. She could not see the eye, just the lower jaw. The tyrannosaur sniffed again, long and slow. It could smell them. Beside her, Dodson was trembling uncontrollably. But Harding was strangely calm. She knew what she had to do. Quickly, she shifted her body, twisting around, moving so her head and shoulders were braced against the rear wheel of the car. Dodgson turned to look at her just as her boots began to push against his lower legs, pushing them out from beneath the car. Terrified, Dodgson struggled, trying to push back, but her position was much stronger. Inch by inch, his boots moved out into the cold morning light. Then his calves... She grunted as she pushed, concentrating every ounce of her energy. In a high-pitched voice, Dodgson said, What the hell are you doing? She heard the tyrannosaur growling. She saw the big feet move. Dodgson said, Stop it! Are you crazy? Stop it! But Harding didn't stop. She got her boot on his shoulder and pushed once more. For a while, Dodgson struggled against her, and then suddenly his body moved easily and she saw that the tyrannosaur had his legs in its jaws and was pulling Dodson out from under the car. Dodson wrapped his hands around her boot, trying to hold on, trying to drag her with him. She put her other boot on his face and kicked hard. He let go. He slid away from her. She saw his terrified face, ashen, mouth open. No words came out. She saw his fingers digging into the mud, leaving deep gouges as he was pulled away and then his body was dragged out. Everything was strangely quiet. She saw Dodson spin around onto his back and look upward. She saw the shadow of the tyrannosaur fall across him. She saw the big head come down, the jaws wide. And she heard Dodson begin to scream as the jaws closed around his body and he was lifted up. Dodgson felt himself rise high into the air, twenty feet above the ground, and all the time he continued to scream. He knew at any moment the animal would snap its great jaws shut and he would die. But the jaws never closed. Dodgson felt stabbing pain in his sides, but the jaws never closed. Still screaming, Dodgson felt himself carried back into the jungle. High branches of trees lashed his face. The hot breath of the animal whooshed in snorts over his body. Saliva dripped onto his torso. He thought he would pass out from terror. But the jaws never closed. Inside the store, they stared at the tiny monitor as Dodson was carried away in the jaws of the Tyrannosaur. Over the radio, they heard his tinny, distant screams. You see, Malcolm said, there is a god. Levine was frowning. The Rex didn't kill him. He pointed to the screen. Look, there, you can see his arms are still moving. Why didn't it kill him? Sarah Harding waited until the screams faded. She crawled out from beneath the car, standing up in the morning light. She opened the door and got behind the wheel. The key was in the ignition. She gripped it with muddy fingers. She twisted it. There was a chugging sound and then a soft whine. All the dashboard lights came on. Then silence. Was the car working? She turned the wheel and it moved easily. So the power steering was on. Doc? Yes, Sarah. The car's working. I'm coming back. Okay, he said. Hurry. She put it in drive and felt the transmission engage. The car was unusually quiet, almost silent, which was why she was able to hear the faint thumping of a distant helicopter. Daylight. She was driving beneath a thick canopy of trees back toward the village. She heard the sound of the helicopter build in intensity, then it roared overhead, unseen through the foliage above. She had the window down and was listening. It seemed to move off to her right, toward the south. The radio clicked. Sarah! Yes, Doc? 
Listen, we can't communicate with the helicopter. Okay, she said. She understood what had to be done. Where's the landing site? South, about a mile. There's a clearing. Take the ridge road. She was coming up to the fork. She saw the ridge road going off to the right. Okay, she said. I'm going. Tell them to wait for us, Thorne said. Then come back and get us. Everybody okay, she said. Everybody's fine, Thorne said. She followed the road. Hearing a change in the sound of the helicopter, she realized it must be landing. The rotors continued a low whir, which meant the pilot wasn't going to shut down. The road curved off to the left. The sound of the helicopter was now a muted thumping. She accelerated, driving fast, careening around the corner. The road was still wet from the rains the night before. She wasn't raising a cloud of dust behind her. There was nothing to tell anyone that she was here. Doc, how long will they wait? I don't know, Thorne said over the radio. Can you see it? Not yet, she said. Levine stared out the window. He looked at the lightning sky through the trees. The streaks of red were gone. It was now a bright, even blue. Daylight was definitely coming. Daylight. And then he put it together. He shivered as he realized. He went to the window on the opposite side, looked out toward the tennis court. He stared at the spot where the Carnotauruses had been the night before. They were gone now, just as he feared. This is bad, he said. It's only just now eight, Thorne said, glancing at his watch. How long will it take her? Levine said. I don't know, three or four minutes. And then to get back? Levine said. Another five minutes. I hope we make it that long. He was frowning unhappily. Why? Thorne said. We're okay. In a few minutes, Levine said, we'll have direct sun shining down outside. So what? Thorne said. The radio clicked. Doc? Sarah said. I see it. I see the helicopter. Sarah came around a final curve and saw the landing side off to her left. The helicopter was there, blades spinning. She saw another junction in the road with a narrow road leading left down a hill into jungle and then out to the clearing. She drove down it, descending a series of switchbacks, forcing her to go slow. She was now back in the jungle beneath the canopy of trees. The ground leveled out. She splashed across a narrow stream and accelerated forward. Directly ahead there was a gap in the tree canopy and sunlight on the clearing beyond. She saw the helicopter. Its rotors were beginning to spin faster. It was leaving. She saw the pilot behind the bubble wearing dark glasses. The pilot checked his watch, shook his head to the co-pilot, and then began to lift off. Sarah honked her horn and drove madly forward, but she knew they could not hear her. Her car bounced and jolted. Thorne was saying, What is it? Sarah, what's happening? She drove forward, leaning out the window, yelling, Wait! Wait! but the helicopter was already rising into the air, lifting up out of her view. The sound began to fade. By the time her car burst out of the jungle into the clearing, she saw the helicopter heading away, disappearing over the rocky rim of the island. And then it was gone. Let's stay calm, Levine said, pacing the little store. Tell her to get back right away, and let's stay calm. He seemed to be talking to himself. He walked from one wall to the next, pounding the wooden planks with his fist. He shook his head unhappily. Just tell her to hurry. You think she can be back in five minutes? Yes, Thorne said. Why? What is it, Richard? Levine pointed out the window. Daylight, he said. We're trapped here in daylight. We were trapped here all night, too, Thorne said. We made it okay. But daylight is different, Levine said. Why? Because at night, he said, this is Carnotaurus territory. Other animals don't come in. We saw no other animals at all around here last night. But once daylight comes, the Carnotaurus can't hide anymore. Not in open spaces, in direct sunlight, so they'll leave. And then this won't be their territory anymore. Which means? Levine glanced at Kelly over by the computer. He hesitated, then said, Just take my word for it. We have to get out of here right away. And go where? Sitting at the computer, Kelly listened to Thorne talking to Dr. Levine. She fingered the piece of paper with Arby's password on it. She felt very nervous. The way Dr. Levine was talking was making her nervous. She wished Sarah was back by now. 
She would feel better when Sarah was here. Kelly didn't like to think about their situation. She had been holding herself together, keeping up her spirits, until the helicopter came. But now the helicopter had come and gone. And she noticed neither of the men was talking about when it would come back. Maybe they knew something. Like it wasn't coming back. Dr. Levine was saying they had to get out of the store. Thorne was asking Dr. Levine where he wanted to go. Levine said, I'd prefer to get off this island, but I don't see how we can, so I suppose we should make our way back to the trailer. It's the safest place now. Back to the trailer, she thought, where she and Sarah had gone to get Malcolm. Kelly didn't want to go back to the trailer. She wanted to go home. Tensely, Kelly smoothed out the piece of damp paper, pressing it flat on the table beside her. Dr. Levine came over. Stop fooling around, he said. See if you can find Sarah. I want to go home, Kelly said. Levine sighed. I know, Kelly, he said. We all want to go home. And he walked away again, moving quickly, tensely. Kelly pushed the paper away, turning it over and sliding it under the keyboard in case she should need the password again. As she did so, her eye was caught by some writing on the other side. She pulled the paper out again. She saw Site B Legends, East Wing, Laboratory, Outlying, Convenience Store, Gas Station, Manager's House, Security One, River Dock, Swamp Road, Mountain View Road, West Wing, Assembly Bay, Main Core, Worker Village, Pool Slash Tennis, Jog Path, Security Two, Boathouse, River Road, Cliff Road, Loading Bay, Entrance, Geo Turbine, Geo Core, Putting Greens, Gas Lines, Thermal Lines, Solar One, Ridge Road, Holding Pens. She realized at once what it was, a screenshot from Levine's apartment. From the night when Arby had been recovering files from the computer, it seemed like a million years ago, another lifetime. But it had really been only, what, two days ago. She remembered how proud Arby had been when he had recovered the data. She remembered how they had all tried to make sense of this list. Now, of course, all these names had meaning. They were all real places. The laboratory, the worker village, the convenience store, the gas station. She stared at the list. You're kidding, she thought. Dr. Thorne, she said, I think you'd better look at this. Thorne stared as she pointed at the list. You think so, he said. That's what it says, a boathouse. Can you find it, Kelly? You mean find it on the video, she shrugged. I can try. Try, Thorne said. He glanced at Levine, who was across the room, pounding on the walls again. He picked up the radio. Sarah, it's Doc. And the radio crackled. Doc, I've had to stop for a minute. Why, Thorne said. Sarah Harding was stopped on the ridge road. Fifty yards ahead, she saw the Tyrannosaur going down the road away from her. She could see that he had Dodson in his mouth, and somehow Dodson was still alive. His body was still moving. She thought she could hear him scream. She was surprised to find she had no feeling about him at all. She watched dispassionately as the Tyrannosaur left the road and headed off down a slope back into the jungle. Sarah started the car and drove cautiously forward. At the computer console, Kelly flicked through video images one after another until finally she found it. A wooden dock, enclosed inside a shed or a boathouse, opened to the air at the far end. The interior of the boathouse looked in pretty good shape. There weren't a lot of vines and ferns growing over things. She saw a power boat tied up, rocking against the dock. She saw three oil drums to one side, and out the back of the boathouse there was open water and sunlight. It looked like a river. What do you think? she said to Thorne. I think it's worth a try, he said, looking over her shoulder. But where is it? Can you find a map? Maybe, she said. She flicked the keys and managed to get back to the main screen with its perplexing icons. Arby awoke, yawned, and came over to look at what she was doing. Nice graphics. You logged on, huh? Yeah, 
she said. I did, but I'm having a little trouble figuring it out. Levine was pacing, staring out the windows. This is all well and good, he said, but it is getting brighter out there by the minute. Don't you understand? We need a way out of here. This building is single-wall construction. It's fine for the tropics, but it's basically a shack. It'll do, Thorne said. For three minutes, maybe. I mean, look at this, Levine said. He walked to the door, wrapped it with his knuckles. This door is just... With a crash, the wood splintered around the lock, and the door swung open. Levine was thrown aside, landing hard on the floor. A raptor stood hissing in the doorway. A way out. Sitting at the console, Kelly was frozen in terror. She watched as Thorne ran forward from the side, throwing the full weight of his body against the door, slamming it hard against the raptor. Startled, the animal was knocked back. The door closed on its clawed hand. Thorn leaned against the door. On the other side, the animal snarled and pounded. Help me, Thorn shouted. Levine scrambled to his feet and ran forward, adding his weight. I told you, Levine shouted. Suddenly, there were raptors all around the store, snarling. They threw themselves at the windows, denting the steel bars, pushing them in toward the glass. They slammed against the wooden walls, knocking down shelves, sending cans and bottles clattering to the floor. In several places, the wood began to splinter on the walls. Levine looked back at her. Find a way out of here! Kelly stared. The computer was forgotten. Come on, Kel, Arby said. Concentrate. She turned back to the screen, unsure what to do. She clicked on the cross in the left corner. Nothing happened. She clicked on the upper left circle. Suddenly, icons began to print out rapidly, filling the screen. Don't worry, there must be a key to explain it, Arby said. We just need to know what... But Kelly was not listening. She was pressing more buttons and moving the cursor, already trying to get something to happen, to get a help screen, something, anything. Suddenly, the whole screen began to twist, to distort. What did you do? Arby said in alarm. Kelly was sweating. I don't know, she said. She pulled her hands away from the keyboard. It's worse, Arby said. You made it worse. The screen continued to squeeze together, the icons shifting, distorting slowly as they watched. Come on, kids, Levine shouted. We're trying, Kelly said. Arby said, it's becoming a cube. Thorne pushed the big glass-walled refrigerator in front of the door. The raptor slammed against the metal, rattling the cans inside. Where are the guns? Levine said. Sarah has three in her car. Great. At the windows, some of the bars were now so deeply dented that they broke the glass. Along the right-hand wall, the wood was splintering, tearing open big gaps. We have to get out of here, Levine shouted at Kelly. We have to find a way. He ran to the rear of the store, to the bathrooms, but a moment later he returned. They're back there, too. It was happening fast all around them. On the screen, she now saw a rotating cube turning in space. Kelly didn't know how to stop it. Come on, Kel, Arby said, peering at her through swollen eyes. You can do it. Concentrate. Come on. Everyone in the room was shouting. Kelly stared at the cube on the screen, feeling hopeless and lost. She didn't know what she was doing anymore. She didn't know why she was there. She didn't know what the point of anything was. Why wasn't Sarah here? Standing beside her, Arby said, Come on, do the icons one at a time, Kel. You can do it. Come on, stay with it. Focus. But she couldn't focus. She couldn't click on the icons. They were rotating too fast on the screen. There must be parallel processors to handle all the graphics. She just stared at it. She found herself thinking of all sorts of things, thoughts that just came unbidden into her mind. The cord under the desk, hardwired, lots of graphics. Sarah talking to her in the trailer. Come on, Kel, you have to do this now. Find a way out. In the trailer, Sarah said, Most of what people tell you will be wrong. It's important, Kel, Arby said. He was trembling as he stood beside her. She knew he concentrated on computers as a way to block things out, as a way to... The wall splintered wide, an eight-inch plank cracking inward, and a raptor stuck his head through, snarling, snapping his jaws. She kept thinking of the cord under the desk. The cord under the desk. Her legs had kicked the cord under the desk. The cord 
under the desk. Arby said, it's important. And then it hit her. No, she said to him, it's not important. And she dropped off the seat, crawling down under the desk to look. What are you doing? Arby screamed. But already Kelly had her answer. She saw the cable from the computer going down into the floor through a neat hole. She saw a seam in the wood. Her fingers scrabbled at the floor, pulling at it, and suddenly the panel came away in her hands. She looked down. Darkness. Yes, there was a crawl space. No more. A tunnel. She shouted, Here! The refrigerator fell forward. The raptors crashed through the front door. From the sides, other animals tore through the walls, knocking over the display cases. The raptors sprang into the room, snarling and ducking. They found the bundle of Arby's wet clothes and snapped at them, ripping them apart in fury. They moved quickly, hunting. But the people were gone. Escape Kelly was in the lead, holding a flashlight. They moved, single file, along damp concrete walls. They were in a tunnel four feet square with flat metal racks of cables along the left side. Water and gas pipes ran near the ceiling. The tunnel smelled moldy. She heard the squeak of rats. They came to a wide junction. She looked both ways. To the right was a long, straight passageway going into darkness. It probably led to the laboratory, she thought. To the left was a much shorter section of tunnel with stairs at the end. She went left. She crawled up through a narrow concrete shaft and pushed open a wooden trap door at the top. She found herself in a small utility building surrounded by cables and rusted pipes. Sunlight streamed in through broken windows. The others climbed up beside her. She looked out the window and saw Sarah Harding driving down the hill toward them. Harding drove the explorer along the edge of the river. Kelly was sitting beside her in the front seat. They saw a wooden sign for the boathouse up ahead. So it was the graphics that gave you the clue, Kelly? Harding said admiringly. Kelly nodded. I just suddenly realized it didn't matter what was actually on the screen. What mattered was there was a lot of data being manipulated, millions of pixels spinning there, and that meant there had to be a cable. And if there was a cable, there must be a space for it, and enough space that workmen could repair it, all of that. So you looked under the desk. Yes, she said. That's very good, Harding said. I think these people owe you their lives. Not really, Kelly said with a little shrug. Sarah shot her a look. All your life, other people will try to take your accomplishments away from you. Don't you take it away from yourself. The road was muddy alongside the river and heavily overgrown with plants. They heard the distant cries of the dinosaurs somewhere behind them. Harding maneuvered around a fallen tree, and then they saw the boathouse ahead. Uh-oh, Levine said. I have a bad feeling. From the outside, the building was in ruins and heavily overgrown with vines. The roof had caved in in several places. No one spoke as Harding pulled the explorer up in front of a pair of broad double doors sealed with a rusted padlock. They climbed out of the car and walked forward in ankle-deep mud. You really think there's a boat in there? Arby said doubtfully. Malcolm leaned on Harding while Thorne threw his weight against the door. Rotten timbers creaked, then splintered. The padlock fell to the ground. Harding said, here, hold him, and put Malcolm's arm over Thorne's shoulder. Then she kicked a hole in the door wide enough to crawl through. Immediately she went inside into darkness. Kelly hurried in after her. What do you see? Levine said, pulling planks away to widen the hole. A furry spider scurried up the boards, jumping away. There's a boat here, all right, Harding said, and it looks okay. Levine pushed his head through the hole. I'll be damned, he said. We just might get out of here after all. Exit. Lewis Dodgson fell. Tumbling through the air, he dropped from the mouth of the Tyrannosaur and landed hard on an earthen slope. The breath was knocked out of him, his head slammed down, and he was dizzy for a moment. He opened his eyes and saw a sloping bank of dried mud. 
He smelled a sour odor of decay, and then he heard a sound that chilled him. It was a high-pitched squeaking. He got up on one elbow and saw he was in the Tyrannosaur nest. The sloping mound of dried mud was all around him. Now there were three infants here, including one with a piece of aluminum wrapped around its leg. The infants were squeaking with excitement as they toddled toward him. Dodson scrambled to his feet, unsure of what to do. The other adult Tyrannosaur was on the far side of the nest, purring and snorting. The one that had brought him was standing over him. Dodson watched the babies moving toward him with their downy necks and their sharp little jaws, and then he turned to run. In an instant, the big adult brought his head down, knocking Dodson over. Then the Tyrannosaur raised its head again and waited, watching. What the hell is going on? Dodson thought. Cautiously he got to his feet again, and again he was knocked down. The infants squeaked and came closer. He saw that their bodies were covered in bits of flesh and excrement. He could smell them. He got up on all fours and began crawling away. Something grabbed his leg, holding him. He looked back and saw that his leg was in the jaws of the Tyrannosaur. The big animal held it gently for a moment, then... It bit down decisively. The bones snapped and crunched. Dodson screamed in pain. He could no longer move. He could no longer do anything but scream. The babies toddled forward eagerly. For a few seconds they kept their distance, heads darting forward to take quick bites. But then, when Dodson did not move away, one hopped up on his leg and began to bite at the bleeding flesh. The second jumped on his crotch and pecked with razor-sharp jaws at his waist. The third came right alongside his face and with a single snap bit into his cheek. Dotson howled. He saw the baby eating the flesh of his own face. His blood was dripping down its jaws. The baby threw its head back and swallowed the cheek and then turned, opened its jaws again and closed over Dodgson's neck. Seventh Configuration Partial restabilization may occur after eliminating destructive elements. Survival partly determined by chance events. Ian Malcolm Departure the boat left the jungle river behind and moved into darkness. The walls of the cave echoed the throb of the engines as Thorne steered the boat through the swift tidal current. To their left, a waterfall splashed down, a ray of light on cascading water. And then they burst out, moving beyond the high cliff wall and the crashing surf into the open ocean. Kelly gave a cheer and threw her arms around Arby, who winced and smiled. Levine looked back at the island. I have to admit, I never thought we'd make it. But with our cameras in place and the uplink working, I expect we can continue to gather the data until we finally get our answer about extinction. Sarah Harding stared at him. Maybe we will and maybe we won't. Why not? It's a perfect lost world. She stared at him in disbelief. It's nothing of the sort, she said. Too many predators, remember? Well, so it may appear, but we don't know. Richard, she said, Ian and I checked the records. They made a mistake on that island many years ago, back when the lab was still in production. What mistake? They were manufacturing infant dinosaurs, and they didn't know what to feed them. For a while, they gave them goat's milk, which was fine. It's very hypoallergenic. But as the carnivores grew, they fed them a special animal protein extract. And the extract was made from ground-up sheep. Levine said, So? What's wrong with that? In a zoo, they never use sheep extract, she said, because of the danger of infection. Infection? Levine repeated in a low voice. What kind of infection? Prions, Malcolm said from the other side of the boat. Levine looked blank. Prions, Harding said, are the simplest disease-causing entities known, even simpler than viruses. They're just protein fragments. They're so simple they can't even invade a body. They have to be passively ingested. But once eaten, they cause disease. Scrapie? In sheep? 
mad cow disease, and kuru, a brain disease in human beings, and the dinosaurs developed a prion disease called DX from a bad batch of sheep protein extract. The lab battled it for years, trying to get rid of it. You're saying they didn't? For a while, it seemed as if they did. The dinosaurs were flourishing, but then something happened. The disease began to spread. The prions are excreted in feces, so it is possible... Excreted in feces? Levine said. The compies were eating feces. Yes, the compies are all infected. The compies are scavengers. They spread the protein over carcasses, and other scavengers became infected. Eventually, all the raptors were infected. Raptors attack healthy animals, not always successfully. One bite, and the animal becomes infected. And so, bit by bit, the infection spread through the island again. That's why the animals die early. And the rapid die-off supports a much larger predator population than you would expect. Levine was visibly anxious. You know, he said, one of the compies bit me. I wouldn't worry. Harding said, there may be a mild encephalitis, but it's usually just a headache. We'll get you to a doctor in San Jose. Levine began to sweat. He wiped his forehead with his hand. Actually, I don't feel very good at all. It takes a week, Richard, she said. I'm sure you'll be fine. Levine sank back in his seat unhappily. But the point, she said, is that I doubt this island will be able to tell you very much about extinction. Malcolm stared back at the dark cliffs for a moment and then began to speak. Maybe that's the way it should be, he said, because extinction has always been a great mystery. It's happened five major times on this planet and not always because of an asteroid. Everyone's interested in the Cretaceous die-out that killed the dinosaurs, but there were die-outs at the end of the Jurassic and the Triassic as well. They were severe, but they were nothing compared to the Permian extinction, which killed 90% of all life on the planet, on the seas, and on the land. No one knows why that catastrophe happened. But I wonder if we are the cause of the next one. How is that? Kelly said. Human beings are so destructive, Malcolm said. I sometimes think we're a kind of plague that will scrub the earth clean. We destroy things so well that I sometimes think maybe that's our function. Maybe every few eons some animal comes along that kills off the rest of the world, clears the decks, and lets evolution proceed to its next phase. Kelly shook her head. She turned away from Malcolm and moved up the boat to sit alongside Thorn. Are you listening to all that? Thorn said. I wouldn't take any of it too seriously. It's just theories. Human beings can't help making them, but the fact is that theories are just fantasies and they change. When America was a new country, people believed in something called phlogiston. You know what that is? No? Well, it doesn't matter, because it wasn't real anyway. They also believed that four humors controlled behavior. And they believed that the Earth was only a few thousand years old. Now we believe the Earth is four billion years old, and we believe in photons and electrons. And we think human behavior is controlled by things like ego and self-esteem. We think those beliefs are more scientific and better. Aren't they? Thorne shrugged. They're still just fantasies. They're not real. Have you ever seen a self-esteem? Can you bring me one on a plate? How about a photon? Can you bring me one of those? Kelly shook her head. No, but... And you never will, because those things don't exist, no matter how seriously people take them, Thorne said. A hundred years from now, people will look back at us and laugh. They'll say, you know what people used to believe? They believed in photons and electrons. Can you imagine anything so silly? They'll have a good laugh, because by then there will be newer and better fantasies. Thorn shook his head. And meanwhile, you feel the way the boat moves? That's the sea. That's real. You smell the salt in the air? You feel the sunlight on your skin? That's all real. You see all of us together? That's real. 
Life is wonderful. It's a gift to be alive, to see the sun and breathe the air. And there isn't really anything else. Now look at that compass and tell me where south is. I want to go to Puerto Cortes. It's time for us all to go home. The End You've been listening to The Lost World by Michael Crichton, narrated by George Guidel.